Benjamin Peck Keith. Benjamin Peck Keith was an American poet, nothing much is known about him. It is believed that he was born in the year 1857. His father was Edwin S. Keith, and his mother was named Julia Prilera. He got married at the age of 56 to Kate Ross Tyson, on 13 November 1913 in San Francisco. He has published a collection of poetry entitled Spoons of Silver and Spoons of Tin, and other poems in the year 1921. One of his well-known poems is called The Memory of Arizona. The Story of Titanic The Titanic was owned by White Star Line Company, and captained by Edward John Smith. The Titanic was the largest ship afloat, at the time of her maiden voyage, and carried 2,224 people, on that maiden voyage, from Southampton, on 10th of April 1912, to her destination New York City, but her last port of call was at Comp, Queenstown, in Ireland on 11th of April 1912. Designed to be the epitome of style, comfort and luxury and including an onboard gymnasium, swimming pool, libraries and exquisite restaurants and cabins, as well as a powerful wireless telegraph system, it is not surprising to hear that the passengers aboard Titanic included some of the wealthiest people in the world like Isidore Strauss, J. Bruce May, and John Jacob Astor IV, although it is worth noting that there was also well over a thousand emigrants from Britain. Ireland and Scandinavia on board too, all seeking a new life in North America. On April 14, after four days of uneventful sailing, Titanic received sporadic reports of ice from other ships, but she was sailing on calm seas under a moonless, clear sky. Titanic was sailing full speed off the coast of Newfoundland, in the North Atlantic Ocean, when the tragedy occurred, at about 11.30 p.m. A lookout saw an iceberg coming out of a slight haze dead ahead, then rang the warning bell and telephoned the bridge. The engines were quickly reversed and the ship was turned sharply. Instead of making direct impact, Titanic seemed to graze along the side of the berg, sprinkling ice fragments on the forward deck. Sensing no collision, the lookouts were relieved. They had no idea that the iceberg had a jagged underwater spur which slashed a 300-foot gash in the hull below the ship's waterline. By the time Captain Smith toured the damaged area with Thomas Andrews, the head designer, five compartments were already filling with seawater, and the bow of the doomed ship was alarmingly pitched downward, allowing seawater to pour from one bulkhead into the neighboring compartment. Titanic nearly perpendicular and with many of her lights still aglow, finally dove beneath the ocean's surface at about 2.20 a.m. on April 15. Throughout the morning, RMS Carpathia, after receiving Titanic's distress call at midnight, and steaming at full speed, while dodging ice flows all night, rounded up all of the lifeboats. They contained only 705 survivors. Of the 2,224 passengers and crew on board, more than 1,500 lost their lives in the disaster. The Wreck of Titanic Out of Southampton, she swung with the stream, a poem of iron and steel, a sea dream, and thousands on shore, watched her steaming away, the largest, and grandest of all ships that day. And the thousand on board, did security feel, for no eye saw death, as he stood at the wheel, directing her course to the echoless shore, her first and last haven of nevermore. She was the last, best work of men, and on her first voyage was speeding, when, out of the darkness, out of the night, loomed an ominous form of ghostly white. was towering mountain of ice, gigantic, as ever was seen on the North Atlantic. She struck, with a shiver from stem to stern, and was rapidly sinking, all soon did learn. Then Captain Smith, her commander brave, thought not one moment, his own life to save, but stood on the bridge, calling out to the crew, remember your country, be British, be true.
and England, and Ireland, and Scotland, and Wales, proved there to the world, their valor ne'er fails, the women and children first, was their cry, and every one of the crew, stood by. And the boats were lowered and sent away, that cut off all hope, save eternity, and, the Titanic sang from sight, beneath the sea, while her band played, Nearer my God to thee. Was there ever a scene, so awfully grand, as that sinking ship, with her plain band, all glory to Smith, and the Titanic's men, they bring Trafalgar's heroes to memory again. And that heart thrilling tale of the Alamo, and the last grand charge at Waterloo, and that charge of the Light Brigade, as well, and Jim Bloodsoe's act, on the Prairie Bell. And with these down the corridors of all time, the Titanic's story shall sound sublime, for never was courage more noble and true, than was shown on that night, by the Titanic's crew. Analysis In first stanza, the poet describes how the ship Titanic moved out of the port of Southampton. He says that it was as beautiful as a poem, and as unbelievable as a dream. Thousands of people stood on the shore and watched the steam blowing out of the Titanic, as it started to move. It was the largest, grandest, and most magnificent ship, that they had ever seen. Any ocean in the world would dream of beholding her close at heart. In the second stanza, the poet says that the thousands of passengers on board felt very safe, as it was a ship unsinkable and it was Captain Smith at the wheels. Even the Captain Edward J. Smith never thought that the ship was in any sort of danger. In short, they didn't even see death as a distant possibility. Now the Titanic had moved so far away that no sound made on the ship could reach the shore and be echoed back. Never again would the Titanic be this safe. In third stanza, the poet says that man had never created anything more beautiful, and better than the Titanic. As the ship was sailing smoothly, a huge and scary form, white in color, rose from the darkness. In the fourth stanza, the poet reveals that the huge mass of ghostly white form mentioned in the previous stanza, actually was an iceberg, and nobody had seen a larger one in the North Atlantic Ocean. As the Titanic hit the iceberg, the entire structure of the ship was shaken. Soon enough, all the passengers could understand that the ship was sinking. In the fifth stanza, the poet describes the heroism shown by Captain Edward John Smith. He never thought about saving himself, but rather told his crew to be as noble, as the British were known to be. He went down with his ship as a valiant captain as the law of the sea dictates. In the sixth stanza, the poet says that, men from all of the British Isles, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, were present, on the crew of the ship, and they all acted in a courageous way. The women and children were evacuated first. The crew never thought of saving themselves. In seventh stanza, the poet describes how the lifeboats, that had been built for just such an eventuality were now lowered into the water. As the last boat sailed away, the crew knew what awaited them was eternal life in heaven. As the Titanic kept sinking, the eight-member music band on board, led by Wallace Hartley, played a Christian devotional song, Nearer My God to Thee, composed by Sarah Flower Adam, in the 19th century. In eighth stanza, the poet says that there was no more magnificent scene, than that of the band playing on the sinking Titanic. Captain Smith and his crew are as brave as Admiral Horatio Nelson and his fellow soldiers who had fought and won the Battle of Trafalgar, against combined forces of Spanish and French navies. Admiral Nelson was wounded during the battle from a gunshot but stayed at the deck commanding so that his soldiers do not lose their courage. He is called the brave boy by the British. In the ninth stanza, the poet compares the crew of the Titanic to the brave men in real life as well as in poetry, the ones who had fought at the Battle of Alamo and the allied forces who had defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, 
as well as the ones described in the poem The Charge of the Light Brigade, of Lord Alfred Tennyson and Jim Bloodsoe of the Prairie Bell of John Hay. Battle of Alamo, in December 1835, during Texas War for Independence from Mexico a group of Texan volunteer soldiers, occupied the Alamo, a former Franciscan mission, located near the present-day city of San Antonio. On February 23, 1836, a Mexican force numbering in the thousands and led by General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, began a siege of the fort. Though vastly outnumbered, the Alamo's 200 defenders, commanded by James Bowie and William Travis, and including the famed frontiersman, Davy Crockett, held out courageously for 13 days, before the Mexican invaders finally overpowered them. For Texans, the Battle of the Alamo became an enduring symbol of their heroic resistance to oppression and their struggle for independence, which they won later that year. The Battle of Waterloo, which took place in Belgium on June 18, 1815, marked the final defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte, who conquered much of Europe in the early 19th century. Through a series of wars, he expanded his empire across Western and Central Europe. In June 1815, Napoleon's forces marched into Belgium, where separate armies of British and Prussian troops were camped. At the Battle of Ligny, on June 16, Napoleon defeated the Prussians under the command of Gebhard Lebrecht von Blücher. However, the French were unable to totally destroy the Prussian army. Two days later, on June 18, Napoleon led his army of some 72,000 troops against the 68,000-man British army, which had taken up a position south of Brussels near the village of Waterloo. The British army, which included Belgian, Dutch and German troops, was commanded by Arthur Wellesley. Duke of Wellington, who had gained prominence fighting against the French during the Peninsular War. In a critical blunder, Napoleon waited until midday to give the command to attack in order to let the waterlogged ground dry after the previous night's rainstorm. The delay gave Blucher's remaining Prussian troops, numbered more than 30,000 time to march to Waterloo and join the battle later that day. Although Napoleon's troops mounted a strong attack against the British, the arrival of the Prussians turned the tide against the French. The French emperor's outnumbered army retreated in chaos. By some estimates, the French suffered more than 33,000 casualties, while British and Prussian casualties numbered more than 22,000. Ultimately, the Battle of Waterloo marked the end of Napoleon's storied military career. He reportedly rode away from the battle in tears. The Charge of the Light Brigade was a charge of British light cavalry led by Lord Cardigan against Russian forces during the Battle of Balaclava on October 25, 1854. In the Crimean War, because of a miscommunication the light infantry was sent into a frontal assault against a well-prepared Russian forces. The assault ended with very high British casualties. The events were the subject of Lord Alfred Tennyson's narrative poem The Charge of the Light Brigade, published just six weeks after the event. Its lines emphasize the valor of the cavalry. In bravely carrying out their orders, regardless of the obvious outcome, Jim Bloodsoe of the Prairie Bell is a poem by John Hay. Hay's original poem describes Jim Bloodsoe's courage and selflessness in sacrificing his own life, so that the passengers on his burning boat might survive. In the last stanza, the poet says that, the story of the Titanic deserves a place in history, with all the heroes described in the previous stanza. In fact, the courage shown by the crew of the Titanic, on the night it sank was supreme and noble and it will be sung till the end of time. The captain, the music band and the rest of the crew decided to sink with the ship though they could save themselves. The last lifeboat left the ship with 28 men while it could carry 64. They went down to the bottom of the Atlantic as brave hearts.